If we go through the, the empires that had an influence on Israel and Judah, what we realize is that it begins with the Assyrians, and the Assyrians are the first major empire to begin to dominate this part of the Middle East. They then attack the northern kingdom of Israel. In 722, that northern kingdom is destroyed. They continue to, to then have sway over that, that area of the Middle East until the next major empire, which of course is the Babylonians. The Babylonians defeat the Assyrians and later on in 586 destroy the land of Judah. So Judah is destroyed, Jerusalem is destroyed, the temples removed, and the, the leaders, the intelligentsia of the people of Israel are taken into exile in Babylon. And they're in Babylon for 60 years before the next empire. And it's this empire that begins the process of change for the, the, uh, these Jewish people and for the connections that happen for Judaism. Because the next empire is, of course, the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire. The Persian Empire, of course, is the empire connected today to the country or the environment called uh, Iran. And what we need to realize is that when we, when we come to, to look at Persia, we're seeing Iran. Okay, uh, the, today the modern day uh, area of Iran. And so it's there on the, 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 the far part of the Middle East or the far eastern environment of the Middle East. And so the Persians begin to take over. With Sometimes the Persians are also connected with another people called the Medes. And uh, I'll write those down. So we have the Persians and the Medes. So we've got the Medes and the Persians, and those two connect to actually destroy the Babylonian Empire, and after that, take over that part of the Middle East, which we would call the Holy Land, or Israel, or whatever else you want to call it. Uh, what we need to realize is that those Persians were different to the empires that had gone before. Instead of trying to destroy these other nations, what they did was they allowed the other nations to have a certain amount of autonomy. They were encouraged to follow their own religion. They were encouraged to follow their own cultural practices, even their own languages. All they had to do was to admit or succeed to allow the Persians to be the overlords over what they did. And so it's in the midst of this that Cyrus, the Persian, signs the emancipation of the, the Jews and allows them to go back and reestablish their homeland in Israel, or in fact in Judah as they would be called still at this point. And so what happens is they go back, they reestablish Jerusalem, they build the city walls, they build the temple, as we've already found out about in terms of Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, the, the Persians also were very different to some of the other, other nations around, because not only were they intolerant of other religions, but the dominant religion of Persia was also a different kind of religion to what those other religions were. You may remember from an earlier module, module that most of the religions of the Middle East and in fact of the world at this time were polytheist. Therefore they believed in many gods. The Persians believed rather in one god as well. They were monotheist just like the Jews. They were monotheist. And their religion we now call after the prophet of their religion. Just like Muhammad is the prophet of Islam. And sometimes Jesus is seen as the prophet of Christianity. The prophet of the Persian religion is called, his name was Zoroaster. Zoroaster. And so, so often the Persian religion is named after him. Sometimes it's called Zoroastrianism. And what he did was he brought to the Persians a religion, in fact, where there was only one God. And that one God was all good. And his name was Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda. Now, this is important because the Jews would have felt an affinity with the Persians, which they didn't feel with the Babylonians or the Assyrians or any of the other nations around them. There would be a connection because they would also be able to quickly understand that the Persians also believed only in one God. And so there would be a dialogue that would develop. Remember that the Jews were still living in the parts where the Persian Empire was. 
The, the Jews had grown up within that environment. They had, would have seen Zoroastrianism. They would have understood. They would have maybe even argued, as Jews do, with some of the Zoroastrian priests. And by arguing with them, they would have found new concepts, new ideas that would have slowly but surely become incorporated into, into Judaism. Now we see some of the process of that in some of the later books of, of uh, the Tanakh. Uh, for example, the second half of the book of Daniel. Uh, the second half of the book of Daniel has imagery in it that really does connect more with, with Persia than it does with some of the things that had gone before. If we look at the book of Job, there's no question that the book of Job comes up with a new thing in terms of the person of Satan. This is not something that is previously within the Tanakh. Uh, the only other time that we talk about the Tanakh, we're having a concept of Satan, is sometimes we talk about the snake in uh, Genesis chapter 3. But the snake is still a snake. It's not an angel. It certainly isn't an angelic being, uh, which we find in the book of Job. Yet, Zoroastrianism does have angelic beings. And not only that, but also has somewhat more involved process of the concept of good and evil. Now, this is an exceptionally important concept because this concept of separating good from evil is something that happens in this intertestamental period. Prior to the intertestamental period, it seems as if God contains both good and evil, or at least what we would understand to be evil. It's God who brings both the rain and withholds the rain. It's God who keeps the locusts away and God who sends the locusts. It's God who seems to give life, but then it's also God who seems to take life. For the, the ancient Jews, God was all, and all was in God, both the good of life and the evil of life. There wasn't really a separation between good and evil. That concept of a separation between good and evil begins to happen as the Jews come into contact with, with the Persians. Now, I know that for many of us, we kind of go, well, hang on a second. If it's not there in the beginning, then was it, is it true? I mean, does the devil really exist? Those are, are, are the wrong questions to ask, really. Because what we need to come to understand is that the Bible, and particularly Tanakh, is written over a thousand years. And so when that thousand years begins, their abilities, their, their words, their understanding, their concepts that they have are still limited to their environment. But now that they bump into the Persians, all of a sudden they are now introduced to new concepts and new words to reinterpret their own relationship with God. And that's what we see the Jews doing. Is what the Jews begin to do is they begin to absorb some of the, the concepts and practices and connections of the people around them. And they reinterpret those in the light of their understanding of Yahweh. And it's that reinterpretation in terms of the light of Yahweh that we see happening during this Persian period. And the Persian period is this period of, of real interaction between what was the Jewish people and the people around them. And the drawing from them some of those information. So one of the greatest things is the concept of Ahura Mazda being completely good. Now, of course, if you have a God who is completely good... Yet you look around you and you see the evil, and all things are under God's power, then how do you account for evil? And that's still a question that we live by today. It's still a question that, that is so tricky for, for Christians. And in many ways, Christians uh, are today rejecting some of the answers that came up with. Because the answer that, in fact, Zoroaster came up with is that there must be another force a force not equivalent to Ahura Mazda, but a force that works here in this world. A force that actually is a force not for good, but for evil. And that force must be bound up in someone. And that someone became known as Ahriman. Ahriman. And so Ahriman begins to personify the evil of the world. And what begins to happen now is a cosmic fight. A fight between Ahriman and Ahura Mazda. And of course the fight is find itself, or the highest level of that fight happens now among the human beings. And it's the human beings that can either be working to fulfill the evil of Ahriman, or by doing good works, 
celebrate the works of Ahura Mazda. And so that fight between good and evil really is a fight that begins in the Persian Empire and the connection with how the Persians begin the process of it. You can see that it's not hard to go from Ahriman to Satan to the devil. And so we see that, that the seeds of the devil are sown in the relationship between Judaism and Zoroastrianism and the connections that they begin to face with each other. Of course, the doctrines of the devil grow into the New Testament. And really, it's not really even the New Testament that, that deal with the devil all that well. It's post that. It's once, in fact, Christianity moves into the Gentile areas, that in fact the devil begins to take on another, another flame, another connection. And we'll get to that just now when we look at the Greeks and the Romans. But what we see here is this concept of good versus evil. In theological terms, it's the development of a concept called of dualism. So not that God is all, both good and evil, but rather that God is good and the devil, or Ahriman in this case, is evil. And all the evil of the world can be attributed to Ahriman and all the good of the world can be attributed to Ahura Mazda. And so you can see that straight away this interrelationship, this relationship between the Persians and the Jews would have begun to add something to Judaism. And that's something that it adds to Judaism, changes the doctrine and the theology that is part of Judaism and the way in which Judaism then reacts or connects with, uh, with uh, the, the Persians. And later on, of course, as Judaism flows and out of Judaism flows Christianity, so the theology connects with that as well. So the Persians are important. The Persians are important because they, by virtue of just being very similar but yes, offering very different theological concepts and perspectives begin to transform some of the seeds that would actually be the seeds that would move into and sprout into fruition into the New Testament. 